C++ 20. Um, I'm afraid this won't be the talk that uh, Armin is hoping for. So this won't be a, a grab back of tips and tricks around C++ 20. Um, but just focusing on one kind of tiny um, new feature that they added there. Um, when I reread the paper that introduced that feature and the, uh, the motivational section introducing it, that got me kind of an aha moment. Um, that that feature got added exactly to make me happy. Um, so I'll just delve into that, that tiny part and there won't be any spaceships or um, modules or concepts or anything in here. I'm sorry. Um, so that tiny feature um, revolves around um, my obscene obsession with our string classes, as you might have guessed. Um, because, yeah, what, what uh, do we have there? And, and what pisses us off is um, what we want is <laughs> these wonderful plain old uh, string literals that you have in C that you all know and love. And uh, what we have is um, something that, at least by now, on the syntax level um, looks pleasant, but at the, on, on the runtime level is still a complete disaster. So with a with a plain uh, string literal, you have that in the read-only data, so row data, short for the, the data that doesn't change, that comes with, a, with the executable, um, where there's no runtime cost involved. But with our um, string classes, this O string, O U string stuff, what we have there, even if it is written as just a string literal behind the scenes at runtime, we copy that over. Um, into, so we, we, we uh, create a, uh, or need to allocate something on the heap, copy the data over, um, set up this uh, reference count, which uh, is expensive to modify at runtime, telling you how many pointers or how many users of that single string there are, um, which is, impo which is uh, expensive because it needs to be multi-thread safe. Um, so this is, uh, we don't want that. So um, we, at one point, um, started to, with uh, C++ 17, we had the possibility to use uh, or to introduce these string literal classes, which are a bit better because they use const expr to, at uh, compile time, generate this layout. And uh, we do a bit of a hack there because we have this uh, this reference count, which would need to, to be increased and decreased all the time when you create new um, copies of this, um, which doesn't work because it's in, in read-only data. But we already had a flag there telling you that um, this is a static string that will never go away. So we won't need to increase and decrease the reference count because it will never reach zero anyway. Um, and if it, didn't, if it did, we wouldn't throw it away. Um, so that saves us here that we have this, this uh, flag in that, in that uh, word. And uh, yeah, that's a, a, a bit better, but it still sucks. Um, because what we want is at the top, um, no, what, what we want is at the bottom, what we have is at the top. Um, whenever you use these less expensive string literals, you need to give them a name. You have to reference them by name. They have to be L values. You can't have temporaries there. You can't have R values. What we want is actually something that um, you just write down the string, and then it magically um, gets created at compile time in the read-only data um, without you needing to introduce a variable that names that string, because you don't want to um, repeat every string with a variable with a name that mimics the string um, because you're, yeah, you have 200 strings in your, in your file and you don't want to introduce 200 variables for these strings. That would be ridiculous. But that's what we need to do. If, at the moment, if we want to be fast, we have to go with this ugly string literal that we don't actually want. So, um, what saves us here is um, so-called non-type template parameters, which are not a new thing. 
um, which are used every day already in the, the OU string literal um, from the last slide is actually also using these uh, template parameters. Um, so you can have templates that don't only um, abstract over types but also over values until C++17. These values could mostly just be integers. So you can have an array class or an array template that you um, instantiate for different sizes of the array. And the size is given as a, as a, as a template parameter. Um, so that's not new stuff. The new stuff that comes in with C++20 is um, that these non-type uh, arguments or parameters that you pass in into the template um, no longer need to be just integers, but now also can be classes themselves. Um, so we still have this array with a int um, non-type template parameter, and then we have some function f that is also a template function, and that takes a complete array as its argument, and this is whatever it wants with it. I'm not specific there. Um, I'll clear that up later. And, and, and the next trick is that um, this is not actually a type array, is not a full type because array is uh, parameterized on its size. But um, we don't need to, to when we specify this uh, f template, we don't need to specify a complete type there. We can also deduce the actual type that is used. So this is, this, uh, in the next line, this uh, function f gets called um, with an argument that is an array Four, because it's a string literal with four bytes, including the trailing uh, null byte. So the compiler is smart enough if we tell um, the compiler that f is a template that takes any kind of array, regardless of uh, what the actual um, argument will be for the, for the array template, it will figure that out by, the, by itself. So it's, it's smart enough for that. Um, and this is what will, what will save our day for our ugly uh, string literals. And um, we're still kind of restricted with what kinds of um, classes we can use for these template arguments there. Um, they introduced a new or invented a new uh, kind of, of uh, class types. They call them structural types. Uh, including that they can only have um, public data members. Um, so we had to, to, to make some data members public, but so what? So uh, this is not a, a restriction that hurts us in any way. Um, and with that, ta-da! We now have a template string literal operator function that is um, that takes an O string literal. We, al we already have that. We already have a way to translate a raw string literal, a C string literal, into our O string literal class, which has the right layout, which is done at compile time. And we can take that beast, that class instance of an O string literal, and pass that into this function, and what does that function do? It wants to return an uh, O string, but it can just return the O string literal that we have because we have an implicit conversion, const expr, implicit conversion from O string literal to O string. And with that, what, the only thing we need to do there is the string literal that we take as the argument for this uh, operator function. Uh, at the template argument, we just return that. And with that, to -da, we have now a function call or whatever we, we, we wherever we take an, uh, one of our string classes, we can just write down such a literal. And that's not only for O string, but of course also for O U string. Um, the Microsoft compiler has a bug, so we needed to have two different underline O string versus underline U string names for these two. Um, and the, the um, OU string literal 
one takes the uh, an UTF-16 string with a with a U prefix there, but apart from that, they're the, the same uh, the same uh, underlying technology. And this is uh, finally fully const expert, so we can finally have an array or a, 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 a traditional C C++ array of three differently uh, different length string literals of our OU string literal classes that are generated at compile time, all placed into the uh, text, uh, the row data of the executable, zero runtime overhead. Um, the other thing that we needed for that is the, the second uh, C20 feature that, I'm, that I'll talk about here very shortly is this. For, this, uh, for, the, for the upper one to work, to, be exp to, to actually be const expert, the, uh, the destructor also needs to be const expert now because we, we, we don't invoke the con destructor because it's uh, read only data. We, we never modify that. Um, but the, uh, the standard still mandates that if you have const expert data, that the, uh, the destructor also, even if it's not called, um, needs to be uh, const expert which is now cheap to do because in the case um, that we are in a, in a uh, constant, that we do have some, some, something uh, const expert that is generated at, at compile time, then there's a new function to test whether this code is executed at, at, at compile time. And if it is, we just don't do anything. And if it is not, if, if we are at runtime, if we have a different kind of, of string that was actually constructed on the heap, uh, then we do what we ever did, just uh, decrement the, uh, the ref count. That's it. Um, and to prove that this actually works, and uh, from, from these uh, very lengthy identifiers, you will guess that um, probably we'll have another instance of our famous breaking tool chains uh, since whenever, because now we pollute our executables um, with all these, I mean, all these, all these, uh, um, all these uh, template arguments, these OU string uh, class literal um, instances that we now have in our code, they somehow need to be represented in that uh, executable, and they're represented there with, with very, very, very long um, names that encode their actual content. Um, and yeah, it, it, uh, so this little R that you see on the, that uh, NM instruction, so uh, with the, with the um, GNU compiler, these are prefix with this ZTAX, these uh, symbols, and all of them are marked as R there, which is uh, read-only data, uh, even not exported, so they're hidden inside the inside the shared uh, object and don't uh, incur any runtime relocations, which is important as well. But um, I gave that a try, converted with a, a Clang rewriting plugin lots of our string instances into these uh, wonderful new uh, string literals, only to find the test uh, uh, executables then to to uh, fail during shutdown, because what happens? Um, we have all these wonderful static data all over the place. We have these OSL module things that load shared libraries, and we have these OSL modules that are destructed in runtime because at, 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 uh, at exit because they um, use uh, because they are stored as statics. And what a what an OSL module does at uh, w when you destroy it again, um, then it DL closes the library. Um, that it references. And when you deal close to the library, then the mappings of the library go away, and we have now these pointers from other statics. We now have this po these pointers to the strings that we use from there. But we still use from there, but um, the memory is gone for the string, because in the, in the past, these strings were uh, created on the heap and, and lived as long as we uh, referenced them. But now we cut that through once we um, close the library from which they come, um, from which their row data um, comes, 
and now we run into these great uh, issues where it uh, shut down. Um, we, yeah, chase pointers that are no longer valid and, and crash. Um, one solution, um, the, the underlying exit to not run the destructors uh, of, of all, the, all the static data, um, but that's uh, chickening out. We, 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 we don't do that. Um, what, what I do for the moment is now to, to disable the DL close in the uh, other module and uh, the tests pass. Hooray. Short commercial break. So, um, how close are we? Very close. Until, or um, for a long time, we have this uh, with the latest C++ uh, opt-in thing. So if you build with that, then whatever your compiler offers, C++ 26 by now from some of the latest compilers, um, we use that for, for compilation. So whatever we have in the code base that wouldn't be compatible with C++ 20 has long been cleared out by those people like me who uh, routinely build with that uh, opt-in flag. Um, then I did a, 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 a Gary change to, to actually in configure in our configure script uh, bump the baseline to only allow C++ 20 on newer and ran that on Jenkins and all the bots were green. So all the compilers we use there um, are already fine with, with using C++ 20. Thanks to Cloth recently updating um, the Linux baseline. Because in updating the Linux baseline, he also thankfully updated from GCC 7 to GCC 12. And hooray, GCC 12 is new enough um, to fully support this. Um, we do have in our readme, uh, we only mentioned, for example, Xcode 14, whatever Xcode 14. I assume the, uh, the Jenkins bots are using the latest one as well for the Microsoft compiler. Um, so it might be that with a very old Xcode 14 or a very old Microsoft uh, 2019 compiler, we would run into issues, so we would need to update our readme to, to tell people um, you need to update your version of, of this compiler. But this, it's um, not, you don't need to, 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 to bump your compiler baseline in any way. Um, you just need to, to update to the latest release of, of, of um, the compiler you're using. So we can do the switch now and enjoy this. And that's it. Modulo the missing coffee, but uh, I hope it works out. Um, yeah, Clang is. Uh, I mean, we have the um, the Jenkins Clang version is. What was it? I don't know, but it's new enough as well. So you, you also updated Clang to request Clang 12, I think. So, and even older Clang would, would, would pass anyway. So that's, that's a, a fine one as well. The other question was, uh, it seems incredibly clever uh, what's done. Um, it's clever to me slow. Do you have any idea of the impact of compiler time? Again, what? I didn't get your la last part. <laughs> um, I, I didn't measure that in any way because um, the build takes so long anyway. <laughs> so I have not done. Um, I was happy that I got the, the, the unit tests uh, working now and I'm refining my uh, rewriting uh, Clang plugin to do all these modifications. Um, and when I have, I mean, I already have a quite a substantial amount of, of, modif of changes um, that still works. I, I didn't measure, but I could measure, of course, yeah. That's, that's one point. Um, and if I, if I even, I, I didn't, the latest version, I didn't test them on, on Microsoft yet. Um, so I'm not sure where we hit this limit of uh, breaking 
other people's tool chains. Um, so it might be the case that we can't rewrite everything with the plugins, but need to be a bit more conservative and, and in, in places where we have um, uh, performance improvements from, from using these, uh, no longer initialize them at, at runtime, we can use them uh, and in other places use them not, maybe, if, 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 if we run into these issues. But uh, yeah, I'll, I'll provide numbers before I um, flip, the, flip the button. 